to motivate principal ideal domains, we consider the following example. So this result we assumed last time. Theorem, suppose i is a non-zero ideal in the integers. Then we can write i as all multiples of some fixed integer n, where n is greater than zero. We used this last time to show that all maximal ideals in the integers can be written as all multiples of p for some prime p. Now, for the proof, let's consider the set i plus. Okay, this is going to be all positive elements in i. Now, because i is non-zero and closed under addition, i plus will be non-empty. We invoke the well-ordering principle for the natural numbers. So that says this non-empty set has some smallest element in it. So let's call that n. Now, n is an i plus, which means it's an i, so the ideal generated by n is also contained in i. We want to show the other direction. So let's suppose we have some a that's an i. We want to show that that's a multiple of n. By the division algorithm for integers, okay, that's just a long division, I can write a as n times q plus r, where r is between 0 and n, including 0. Now, a is an i, n is an i, so n times q is an i. That means by the ideal property, r is an i. Because r is between 0 and n, okay, we have the 0 as a possibility, but not the n, n is the least element, that's going to force r to be equal to 0. So we have the n divides a, which is what we're looking for. Now, that says okay, every ideal in the integers is generated by a single element. We've seen this in other examples. So for instance, in r join x, okay, polynomials in x over the reals, we considered the ideal generated by x squared plus 1. In q adjoin x, okay, polynomials in x over the rationals, we considered the ideal generated by x cubed minus 2. In the Gaussian integers, z adjoin i, we consider the ideal generated by 1 plus 2i. So you'll note, so far we've only considered ideals generated by single elements. You might think this is the case in general, but we'll see that this is not true, and then this leads to the definition of principal ideal. For an example of an ideal that must be generated by two or more elements, let's consider the ring z adjoin x. If I consider the ideal, Okay, generated by 2 and x, okay, so by definition this is 2p plus xq, where we let p and q range over all polynomials in x over z. Leave it to you to show that this is an ideal. What happens if we assume that this ideal can be generated by a single element? So let's call that element f. Well, that means 2 is in this ideal, so f will divide 2. f will also have to divide x. And that means, okay, if we think about what happens with polynomials, okay, the only thing we can have f as is equal to plus or minus 1. But you'll note, plus or minus 1 will not be in this set here. So, contradiction, I can't write this ideal as generated by a single element. Same argument's going to show for another example. We take the ideal generated by x and y in R join x and y. Okay, so this is going to be all polynomials in x and i with coefficients in r. Then we see that this can't be written as generated by a single element either. Now, definition, I'll say an ideal in r is principal if there exists some element r in our ring such that i is generated by r. So we're taking all multiples of r here. Now, another definition if r is an integral domain, and we can write every ideal as a principal ideal, so always generated by a single element, then we call r a principal ideal domain. For short, we call that PID. For examples, okay, we've seen at the beginning that the integers form a PID. If we have a field, okay, we've seen last time, the only ideals are zero in the field itself. So fields are always PIDs. We'll see in a little bit, if R is a division algorithm, okay, rings that have division algorithms are going to be things like the integers. Take any field, adjoin X, so polynomials in X over a field, and the Gaussian integers. These are going to be PIDs. 
things that are not PIDs, okay, like we've just seen. We take the integers, we join X. We take polynomials in X and Y over R. And for something that's a little bit more numerical, but we won't show it here, we have the integers adjoin square root of minus five. How do we make use of the principal ideal property? Consider the integers. If I have the ideal generated by 35 and 42, we know we can write that as all multiples of a fixed n. So how do I find n? First we note, Every element in this ideal is a multiple of seven. So 35 is a multiple of seven, 42 is a multiple of seven. Any linear combination of those two over the integers will also be a multiple of seven. So that says our ideal is in the ideal generated by seven. The other direction also holds. Now note, greatest common divisor of 35 and 42 is seven. We invoke Bazou's identity. So there exists an i and j, such that 35i plus 42j is equal to the greatest common divisor of 35 and 42, which is seven. Now, 35 is an i, 42 is an i, so this linear combination is also an i, which means seven is an i. The ideal generated by seven is also an i. So that's our result. So n is equal to seven. Now, in general, if we have an ideal generated by some collection of integers, say m1 through mk, then i is just gonna be generated by the element greatest common divisor m1 through mk. For slightly more complicated example, okay, let's return to this one. We have five ring homomorphism carrying Gaussian integers to z mod five. So we're gonna send phi of a plus bi to a plus two b. If we take the kernel of phi, okay, this is an ideal, that's gonna be all a plus bi, such that a plus two b is a multiple of five. Now, this is a complicated description. With a little bit of work, we were able to show that this is just gonna be the ideal generated by one plus two i. Note, because the image of this homomorphism is a field, that means this ideal here is a maximal ideal. Okay, and that's without actually computing anything other than what the ideal is. Now, another property we have for principal ideal domains. Okay, let's recall the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. What this says, if we have a positive integer n, okay, first step is, is that we can factor it into powers of primes. So I can write n as p1 to the k1, okay, product through pi to the ki, where the p's are primes. The second part is that our factorization is unique. So if we tried factorization of the form, so q1 to the l1, okay, product through qj to the lj, where the q's are primes, then each qm is equal to some pn, and then the exponents have to be equal. So we have existence of a factorization in the primes, we have uniqueness. So this property that we're interested in is called unique factorization property. Now, we want a version of unique factorization for integral domains. For that, we need a definition of primes. So, R is an integral domain, a non-zero non-unit A is called a prime. If whenever A divides BC, we must have A divides B or A divides C. What does this mean? If we take A, we try to portion out parts of A, to B and C, the only way that happens is if all of A goes to B or all of A goes to C. So we can't pull A apart. Note, this is how primes work in the integers. With this, we have definition, R is an integral domain such that, one, all non-zero elements admit a finite factorization into primes, two, the finite factorization is unique up to units, then we call R a unique factorization domain, or UFD for short. It turns out that every PID is a UFD, but we won't show that here. Instead, next time, we'll show the special case that every Euclidean domain is a UFD. If we want examples, then we have that every PID that we've encountered is also a UFD. So for instance, we have the integers, 
Here, the primes are just the usual primes. We have polynomials over the complex numbers. Now, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, every non-constant polynomial over the complexes has a root. And we could use that to show that every polynomial over the complexes factors into linear factors. So here, the primes are going to be the linear polynomials. If we take polynomials over the reals, then the primes are going to be the linears and the irreducible quadratics. For something that's not a UFD, I'm going to take z adjoin, square root of minus 5. In here, I can write 6 as 2 times 3, or as 1 plus square root of minus 5 times 1 minus square root of minus 5. Now in this ring, the units are going to be plus or minus 1, so these factors are not associated, but we would still need to show that they're primes. And we'll just leave this here. When factoring, we're taking elements in our ring and trying to break them down as far as we can. If we have an element that can't be broken down any further, okay, meaning we can only split off units, we'll call that element irreducible. So R is an integral domain. A non-zero non-unit A is called irreducible. If whenever A is equal to B times C, then one of B or C is a unit. In the integers, the irreducibles and primes are the same, but this need not be the case in general. So we're looking for conditions when prime and irreducible imply one another. First, a okay, proposition, R is an integral domain, then prime implies irreducible. So we'll suppose A is prime and A is equal to B times C. I want to show that one of B or C is a unit. Now, because A is equal to B times C, a divides b times c, and by the prime property, a divides b, or a divides c. We'll assume a divides b. So we rewrite that. Okay, there's some r in the ring, such that b is equal to a times r. We substitute, we have a is equal to a r c. Now, because we're in an integral domain, we have a cancellation law, and we can remove the a's. So that leaves 1 equals r times c. That means c is a unit, which is what we were looking for. So we have one direction. In the other direction, okay, this will be true when we're working in a UFD. So proposition, if R is a UFD, then irreducible implies prime. Now, if A is irreducible, that means A is not a unit. And by the unique factorization property, I can write A as, okay, so it'll be U a unit, and then powers of primes. Now, one way we can write A is to let B be equal to P1, so we're going to have some prime power where the exponent's at least 1. Then we'll have everything else. So U times P1 to the K1 minus 1 all the way through PM K to the M. Now, by the irreducible property, that means one of these has to be a unit. And since this is a prime, what's going to happen here is that M is going to be 1, meaning there's only one factor. And then the exponent it's going to be equal to 1 also. So that means A is written as a unit times P1. P1 is a prime. So A is going to be a prime also. These are just off by a unit. And that's what we're looking for. So theorem is, if R is a UFD, that irreducible and prime are the same. So this holds because recall, UFDs are always integral domains. So we have both directions. We have the following recipe for constructing fields when we're in a PID. So the result is, if R is a PID, then the maximal ideals of R are all in the form. Okay, we have ideal generated by R. Well, R is irreducible or equivalently prime. See this? Okay, let's assume M is our maximal ideal. Because we're in a PID, I can write M in the form generated by R, where R is not a unit. And if we assume that R is not a prime, that can write R in the form A times B, where A and B are both not zero and not units. Now, let's see that the ideal generated by A is not the same as the ideal generated by R. So, if they were equal, I'd be able to write A in the form R times S, but that would mean we'd have, okay, using this, R is equal to R times BS, or 1 equals BS and B is a unit, but we're assuming it's not. So, ideal generated by A is not the same as the ideal generated by R. 
and A is not a unit, so it's not equal to the ring itself. So that means that M could not be a maximal ideal. So that gives our result.